Back about two months ago, I was at a UNOS regional meeting up in Newark, <clears throat> and John was one of the speakers, and he did a presentation that I just thought was so positive and such an insight for those of us, especially everybody in this room who's out sharing the news that transplantation works and getting people to take action and sign up to be organ donors. And I thought you should see the results of your work. And so John has a very interesting presentation showing the progress in national donor registrations. John's, uh, what is your particular position with Donate Life America? Uh, I'm the chair of the Donor Designation Collaborative Faculty. Okay. And so John has graciously agreed to work overtime tonight and come on in and share that news with us. John? Great. Okay. <laughs> For those who have seen some of my presentations, I, in the beginning, I'm a little techno-challenged, so I just need to know what goes up and down here. Um, but I'm just going to spend a couple of minutes uh, talking to you about two different things. Um, one is donor designations and basically how we're doing across the country, um, what some of the results have been um, with all of the 50 states that we have uh, surveyed. And then the second part of my presentation is going to be talking about a survey that Donate Life America did that kind of um, talked about why reason, what, the reasons why people donate, why they don't, uh, look a little bit at the ages and ethnicity, uh, because so many of you go out and speak, and I think it might be interesting to see what some of these um, these results have been. And also some of the progress that we've made over the past several years in terms of our public education. Donate Life America is a unique organization because it is a national grassroots organization. And uh, Gift of Life was one of the founding members of Donate Life America. You may have heard of it as Coalition on Donation for many, many years. Um, and then, probably about five years ago, they decided to change their name to Donate Life America. And the primary reason is that even though Gift of Life is one of 58 OPOs throughout the country, we all have different names, we all have different looks. And what we wanted to do is have a unified national symbol and logo. So that, so that no matter where you would go across the country, you could see this logo and you would know that it stood for organ tissue donation. So that's why they changed their name to Donate Life America. So currently, as of the third quarter of last year, we had over 92 million Americans who had the donor designation on their driver's license. Now one of the reasons why we've been focusing so much on donor designations over the last four years is because of the work that happened um, previously, previously to that with donation and transplantation collaborators. And primarily at that time, there was this movement across the country to really try to increase the number of donors and the number of transplants that happened. And so they did a lot of clinical collaboratives bringing together OPOs, transplant centers, donor hospitals, those organizations that had best practices. And so, um, Gift of Life was one of the organizations that had many of those best practices. And so what we did was we developed the protocol so that all of us throughout the country can incorporate those best practices. And so for many years, you've seen the number of donations increase, the number of transplants increase. But one of the challenges that we had with public education was that we really didn't know or we couldn't really measure the impact that the public initiatives had. You know, we could go out and we could talk to people and we could motivate them to say yes. But for many of the states across the country, there was no registry. So what we did was we surveyed all 50 states we, and we came up with seven criteria for what's an effective donor registry. So when we started four and a half years ago with this collaborative, the Donor Designation Collaborative, we started at 60 million people in our country. Our goal is to have 100 actionable donor designations. And what an actionable donor designation is, is that donor, a donor uh, designation on your driver's license or state ID. So in the past four and a half years, we've made significant increases. And this year, by the end of this year, we expect to be well over 100 million. Now, some of the challenges were that while we were fortunate in our region to have several states with registries. There were many states that didn't. So that required many of us to work with our state legislators to create registries, to develop online portals for the registries. 
And so as a result of that, that's why you see the numbers increasing. And any time during the presentation, if you have a question, just stop and, let, and feel free to ask. So currently, out of the 50 states, we have 19 states that have more than 2 million people who uh, have designated themselves, and 31 states that have more than 1 million people. And so much of this depends on the population of the state. But we have seen the number of designations increase a little over 9% over the last 12 months. Now, as, you can, as no surprise to you, that California leads the country because it's one of the most populous states. And so they have 7.3 million people on their registry. You can see in terms of our region, Pennsylvania is fifth with 4.3 million. New Jersey is over here, and they're only a little bit over 2 million. And you may be wondering, why is New Jersey a little bit less than some of the other states? One of the reasons is because New Jersey only established their registry probably about five, six years ago. So while some of these states have been around for a while, New Jersey is playing catch up. Now, could you give us a sense of, <clears throat> if it were ideal, what the number could be? I mean, 100 million uh -huh. compares to how many, if everybody that could donate donated, what would that number be? 200 million? 150 um, million? I will show you. It's on, it's on the slide. Okay. If you, a little bit down the road. Um, yes. Why is Colorado um, estimated? Um, the reason it's estimated is um, one of the challenges that some of our states have is getting information from their DMVs. It's surprising to us sometimes that for some states, they may not be able to tell you how many people have the designation on their license, or sometimes there's a question about the accuracy of the data. <coughs> so that's why for some states, we have to have estimates instead of actual numbers. And that's a challenge that we continue to, to work on. Now, we're fortunate in Pennsylvania and New Jersey that our data is pretty good. Um, Delaware, um, we have one or two little issues with it, but overall, it's, um, we're in pretty good shape for our OPL. Um, and then it just continues to go down. Um, another interesting thing um, that I find is Texas. You would think Texas, being such a large state, would be a lot higher. It will be. One of the challenges that Texas had was with the way that people could access a registry there were many, many steps involved. And so people just basically dropped out because they didn't want to have to go through all the steps. Right. So now what they've done is they've changed it, made it very easy to register right at the DMV. And so now they're averaging about 70,000 people a month putting the organ donor designation mm. on their license. So and you can see Delaware is down here at 306. And Delaware's a small state. <laughs> uh, small but mighty. But Joe, here's the question, here's the answer to your question. We have about 234 uh, million people in the United States over the age of 18 that could be potential donors. And currently, we have uh, 92 that have it on their license. Our goal is to have 100 million. Um, so we're looking to try and get 50% of the population over the age of 18 to eventually get it on their driver's license. Now, I, found, I find this to be a, another way to look at the data. Mm -hmm. Because you know, while California had the highest number of total people, when you looked at the total number of designated drivers, their percentage is fairly low because they are still a fairly new registry. But what this slide tells us is that, first of all, Alaska and Montana have the highest number of people, the highest percentage of their population have the designation on their license, 75%. So when we look at our states and we have 45, 30%, we know we can do a lot better because other states, so many other states are much higher than what we are. And there are a lot of reasons for that. But I think also what's kind of interesting about this is if you look at the top five, six states, you'll see that they're almost all where? In the Northwest. 
Now, you know, there are many reasons, but I think part of the reason um, why their uh, percentages are so high is because, you know, for Washington, for example, or Oregon, they're, they're viewed as being fairly more liberal in their views. They may not have the diversity in their state that Pennsylvania or New Jersey may have. Um, also with Utah, for example, they most of the population is within three basic metro areas. So it's fairly easy to get to most of the people in that state if you just target those three <coughs> major cities. Our, in our states, we have a lot more challenges, as you well know, because you do a lot of public education. So um, we have no doubt that our numbers will continue um, to increase. I think also the interesting fact about Indiana, why they're at 68%, one of the reasons why they're so high is because they have invested in high school education. And they have a curriculum in high schools that have been, that has been around probably for 10 to 15 years. And so when they look at their designated donors and their drivers, they see that since they instituted that high school program, the number of people that have a designation is much higher than the older people. So we know that high school education works. And we know that mandated high school education works because we see the number of designations much higher. So that's one of the goals that we're having for each of our three states is to have mandated high school education about donation. So as we kind of go through the list, you know, it's, it's kind of interesting, but I'm always wondering where we're at. And so for us, we had um, Delaware right now at 29th, 29th state. Pennsylvania is at 30. Um, so we know that we're kind of in the yellow. We're not part of the green. All the greens are above 50%. So we're slowly but surely getting there. And we've instituted some programs for this year that we hope will increase those numbers dramatically. If you look, you know, New Jersey right now is number 40. And we're not, we're not terribly concerned about that because we know that New Jersey's registry is still relatively new. And we've seen dramatic increases each quarter with the number of people signing up. So we have, I have no doubt that we're gonna go over Arizona, quickly, <coughs> hopefully West Virginia, and just keep marching up the charts. So, so more conservative states tend to have lower rates as opposed to more liberal states that have higher rates? I noticed Arizona, you know, very low. Right. Well, I, I think with Arizona, some of it depends on, on how someone can access the registry. Mm -hmm. For example, with New York, for so long, um, they had to do electronic signatures and they had to do you know, two or three different steps. And people would not want to fill out and sign an electronic signature, then wait for it to be verified in the mail, and then have to send something back. It made it very cumbersome for people to sign up. So most people would say, I'm not going to bother with it. So what they've done in New York is they changed the process. They're also taking the registry from uh, the department, I think it's with the Department of Health, and they're going to establish a private registry in which the Department of Transportation will feed in all of the <coughs> driver's license information so they don't have to play the politics <coughs> and they can control it a lot more. We th they're pretty sure that with that, their numbers are going to increase dramatically because they're going to make it so much easier for people to sign up. Excuse me, John? Yeah. It's Vermont at zero. Uh, Vermont is at zero because they don't have um, an official registry yet. We, uh, I know that they're working on it. They're hoping to get it passed this year. Um, but that's the, that's the last holdout state. For every, um, I don't know if there's any transplant hospitals in Vermont, but for every, for any transplant, they've got to get, get, get the permission from like point zero, since no one has signed up. Um, well, I, I think the challenge for um, the OPO serving those individuals in Vermont is that there's no way that they can access that information on the driver's license to see if there is a designation. They would have to wait and see if there's a, a driver's license or a, they have a state ID card 
to see if, if it is. Otherwise, you're going to have to approach the family. So just to clarify, this is not donation. <coughs> this is designation. Right. It's designation. It's not saying there's nobody from Vermont that donated. No, no, I realize that, but to get a family to no donate, you've got to start from the, the, the um, designation. They have to start from ground zero. As it's, you know mm -hmm. nothing about that. Well, they can have education. They just no, don't have no, registered. but they don't know if the deceased had, had any desire to be the donor unless they spoke to their family. Right, they right. can't access the record. John, how often is this published? This information uh, annually? Um, no, it's quarterly. <clears throat> so, oh, really? Yeah. So, so we, you can really track progress. Mm -hmm. Very much so. And all of us are, re are required to report it on a quarterly basis. Now, Susan brings up a great point. Um, why is designations so important? Why are we placing so much emphasis on it? And the reason is because the key for an OPO is to be able to access that one field on that driver's license so that when the transplant coordinator goes in to talk with the family, they know ahead of time if there is a designation. Now, one of the seven criteria for an effective registry is that the OPOs can access it and that it's first person consent, which means that it's a valid legal document. So that the OPO can go ahead and proceed with donation because we know that that individual has already agreed to it and consented to it. And I'm confused. <coughs> what OPO would OPO be covering like Burlington? <coughs> I think um, which is probably, I think Burlington is the largest city in Vermont. Right. I think with Vermont, it's I think the state is served by two different OPOs, if I'm not mistaken, mm -hmm. New England Gordon Bank, right, um, and then the OPO that's based out of Albany. I think. So. Do you know how many states have those persons? <clears throat> um, I think. Um, I don't know the exact figure, but I know that most of these states now have first-person consent, so I would say it's well over 40 consent. And that is one of the things that we we did when we first began this collaborative, is to move the states who just had a registry of intent, which means someone thought it was a good idea, but it wasn't a valid document, and changing those registries to first-person consent, making it a valid legal document. You know Colorado? Does or no? I really did. Do they have it? <coughs> I, I because don't it was an estimate. That's why yeah. I was wondering whether it's still that one. You know, I, I'm not okay. sure. I can. We have this huge dashboard that I can check, <laughs> but I, I don't know the individual facts for all 50 states. Um, but one of the other things that that we check as well is we also want to check and be able to measure on any given day. How many people can go into a DMV and how many people actually sign up? And that's what we call the donor designation rights. Um, and it's very important for us to, to be able to measure that because we want to know if our public education initiatives are working. So we have 30 states right now who can report that. Now out of the three states that we serve, there's only one state that can't tell us that information and that's the state of Delaware. New Jersey just came on board, and Pennsylvania, we've been able to do that for a while. So, for example, what we see is Colorado, in the third quarter, out of the 321,000 people who went in to get a driver's license, 214 said yes to donation. So, our designation rate for that state is 66%. So what we're looking to do is, for example, uh, for Pennsylvania, we know that overall right now, our average is probably about 45.5%. But we're doing better because we know the number's higher because the people going in, more people are saying yes. So we know that the efforts that you're doing is working because the number will continue to go up. You know, if we were at 50%, let's say, and we see this number being 45, something's not right. It may be the data that the DMV is reporting, or it may be a campaign that we're <coughs> doing that's not working, people. so that means we need to switch it up. So these are a very, it's a very key factor for us in public education to be able to measure how many people are actually saying yes. 
is it possible with Colorado, it's, a, it's becoming a very, very transient state, people think <coughs> they're migrating to Colorado, mm -hmm. and they're going to their driver's licenses, and they've already got one, their, their New York driver's license, and now they're just shifting it over? Is that a possibility? Or is it just because it's Colorado? Well, they, they wouldn't be able to shift over. Um, because it wouldn't automatically transfer to. But they were really, no. What I'm suggesting is that they they came from New York and they had Oregon Division on their New York license, and they're they're going in to get a Colorado license now, and they're figuring, you know, I had it on New York, I'm going to get it in Colorado too. Is that you think that's one of the reasons? That could be because <coughs> we're hoping that when people say yes once, they're going to continue. They're going to yes, they're they're continue through. to say yes. But you know, the other thing too is. Um, you know, looking at this data, for example, I know the folks in Colorado, when they looked at the overall numbers, um, they were not in the top <coughs> two or three, but in the top five or six at least. And so they developed a campaign to make Colorado number one. And that was the whole genesis. And they used <coughs> these statistics to say, you know, we're at, let's say, 45%. We need to be at 75. You can help us. And so by, able, by being able to measure this information, they can tell how effective their campaigns are. So that's just another way, this is just another way that we can, that we can measure. Now you can see New York is very low, but that's <coughs> going to be changing because of the changes that they've made. And when things like changing a registry that requires um, legislation Politicians can always respond to numbers. You know, and especially when you say, for example, with New Jersey, you know, we're pretty low. And we need to do something about it. And here are the ways that Gift of Life and the Sharing Network are going to suggest. And because we know in the other states that it has worked. And so that's another reason why we collect all of this data. So what has been the impact with designations? And I just wanted to show over the last four years the impact in terms of organ, tissue, and eye donors. For example, with organ donation, when we began, only 19% of the donors had the donor designation on. And four years later, it's up to 33%. So you can see with the emphasis that we've been making with designations, the total number of donors is increasing, and we expect that to continue to rise <coughs> each and every year. So in terms of the data, you know, I think it shows that, the, that donor registries play an essential role in obtaining consent, because you can talk to any of our transplant coordinators, and they will say, if they have the designation, it's so much easier going into that hospital because the family already knows. We can talk to the family and say, your loved one already made the decision so you don't have to. Thank you. Oh, no, I'm sorry. Okay. That's okay. John, how do you, how, how do you know this? Do, like, was this a, 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 a <coughs> hospital report a potential donor and then you have a database that you can right. plug their information in? Mm -hmm. And if you plug mine in, and you'd see if I, that I, yes, I had said yes to organ right. donation on my driver's license. Right. What happens is when we get a referral in here, when we get a referral in here, um, we determine if there's a potential for organ and tissue donation, and we'll send out a transplant coordinator. While that coordinator is going out, the people on the second floor in our transplant information center or call center can access the donor registries but the only thing they can access is that one field on your license to see if there's a designation. And if it is, we'll confirm that, and then we'll walk into the hospital knowing that information already. So we'll know if a decision has been made or not. And that's the only way, that's the only field on your driver's license record that an OPO can access. <coughs> and only the OPO can access that information. You know what percentage is, uh, what percentage of the donors are over the age of 18? We're looking at 30, which basically says one third, only one third of the donors have it on their license, but we don't know how many are under the age of 18. They couldn't possibly have it on their license, is that correct? Well, as an OPO, we can 
we can we'll know we know with the donors um, who are like the 16 to 18 year old mm -hmm. how many of them had a designation but with the 16 to 18 year old even though they have a designation we would still need to get parental right. consent that's why when we're talking about these numbers we are only tracking above the age of 18 oh. because that's when an individual mm -hmm. can make their own decision that's what I when, yeah. you, when you state when it says that uh, 33 percent of the donors have earned their license, that's 33 percent of the ones over 18. Over over, right, over the age of 18. Thanks for that clarification. Um, we know that in many states, the majority of the donors are on the registry, um, and that we know that recovery agencies like Gift of Life, we access that re registry each and every time we get a potential donor. Um, and that achieving, being able to um, access and to report designations is a top priority for all of us. So one of our goals for this year with Donate Life America is to make sure that every state can report their donor designation rate. So I've got 10 months to figure out with Delaware how they're going to report it. Now you know, um, which is, this is not going to be going to any government agencies, is it? No. Okay. <coughs> because states pose a, a specific challenge when it comes to reporting. We work with their computer systems. Uh, many times they're understaffed. Um, so we're looking at very creative ways to figure out how to report this data. Now, for example, Washington had a challenge because they couldn't report it themselves. And they went to the state and the state said, you know, there's no, we don't know. We don't document. <coughs> So what they did was they went to the company that produced the driver's licenses. And that company said, oh, we track that. And so that's how they're reporting their information now. It's not through the Department of Transportation, but through the company that's generating the driver's licenses, because they check it. So we're being quite creative sometimes in our approaches. What, what's the holdup with Delaware? Uh, the whole up is their computer system. Um, because to be able to access that information would require a lot of different types of programming, uh, which costs <coughs> money, um, and uh, staffing. So we're looking at how we might be able to overcome some of that. What company makes their driver's license? Mm -hmm. Excuse me? What company makes their driver's license? I, well, that's what we're going to be finding out, trust <laughs> me. Um, now, New Jersey, for example, we had a lot of trouble getting that kind of data. Um, but they're going through a new um, a rewrite of their computer systems. Um, and so we added that into the rewrite, so now we're able to get that information. Make sure Christy doesn't know about that. <laughs> <laughs> yes, well, yeah, we'll, we'll see uh, about him. Um, but New Jersey is coming along well. In Pennsylvania, we've been very fortunate all along with getting the data. Um, one of the things that we can get with Pennsylvania that we can't get with the other two states, for example, is we can get daily reports of people who go online to sign up. So when we do a marketing campaign or when you go out and you speak to, for example, the gospel concert that we had last August, um, we went there, we had our laptops there that people could sign up. We knew how many people signed up at that concert because within two days we get a report and it says for Philadelphia County we had 24 designations that signed up. Now, as a department, we know there weren't any, we didn't know of anything else going on that Sunday. And so we deducted that 24 came from the gospel concert because that was the only thing that was, that would kind of motivate someone um, to sign up. How does the demographic break down between Core on the west on the western end of Pennsylvania and get the life on the eastern part of Pennsylvania. Uh, numbers wise, the, the statistic you showed for Pennsylvania that's the state itself. It's a statewide. What's the breakdown between the two largest cities? Do you know that number? Well, um, not so much the cities, but in terms of the total population, two thirds of Pennsylvania lives in gifts of, gift of life <coughs> because we go as far <coughs> as state college. Hmm. So. So two thirds, one third. Yeah. But the other thing that we can do with Pennsylvania 
is that we can track it according to counties. Mm -hmm. So we can we can look at each county that Gift of Life serves and see how we're doing there. So for example, um, the number one county, Gift of Life is blessed because we have the highest and the lowest county in the state. For our highest county, does anyone know? York? York? No. 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 The highest the highest designated county is Center County, where Penn State is. And they're, I think they're up now up to like 56, 57 percent. Hmm. Oh, uh, oh, percentage. Percentage. The lowest, the county with the lowest percentage? Philadelphia. Is Philadelphia. With less than 30. So, at least for now. Um, but the other part of the presentation that I would like to talk about for a few minutes is a national survey that Donate Life America did. Um, they did this in the beginning of 2010. And what they did was they did a survey over the telephone with 5,000 people. And it was 100 people from each state. And you know each of the states, the, the pool of people reflected the demographics of that particular state. So we were able to get that information, not only nationally, but also broken down according to our states. So there's some interesting uh, statistics that came out of this, some interesting things. And one of them is we know that many people think donation is a good thing. You know, we hear constantly the statistics 85, 90% of people think it's a good thing. But what we wanted to find out is how many people actually wish to be a donor. It's, and that's the difference between thinking it's a good thing and actually wanting to do something about it. And so what we saw in the past year, from 2009 to 2010, it went from 50 to 56%. So we know that public education that we're doing is making a difference. And then we also look to see, in terms of not only do they wish to be a donor, but would they wish to donate all of their organs, some of their organs, none of their organs, or maybe be a little bit reluctant, or undecided. And as you can see, the largest group is people wishing to donate all of their organs. However, this is the market that we're really looking to reach. These are all the undecided. And there are many reasons why people are undecided, and you know what many of them are. And I do have a slide coming up that will tell you a little bit more why. But we see that we're, we're making some, some nice progress from people who don't want to donate at all. We've seen a drop from 19 to 14%. So this is done by a national research company. Um, so you know these statistics, the findings are pretty accurate. So then we wanted to look at the age to see if age would make a difference. And there really isn't that much of a difference what I find a little interesting is it's broken down. This color is young, 18 to 24, and it ranges in age groups. And this is the older population, 65 plus. So if you look at um, people who wish to be a donor and would want to donate all of their organs, at the, at the end of the slide, the two groups that are the lowest are the youngest and the oldest. Um, the undecided also youngest and the oldest. And I think one of the reasons I think why there are a lot of people over the age of 65 who are undecided is because they don't know. You know, there's been a lot of changes. There's no age limit now. Um, and there's a couple other reasons which I'll talk about in a few minutes um, that we can do to help get that number lower. And then we also looked at ethnicity to see among the various populations if there's a difference. <coughs> and for uh, ethnicities who would be willing to donate all of their organs, Caucasian and Asians are the highest group. We all know that there are some challenges working with the African American and the Hispanic population um, just because of some of their cultural beliefs, their, um, sometimes the lack of access to health care, um, some of the myths that may be more prevalent uh, in that community. So, you know, we're working to make sure that those numbers will be going down. 
But as you can see, in the end decided, it's, it's the African American and the Hispanics um, that are the highest groups in that. But then we also want to see if people knew how they could document their decision. What did they know about it? And with the emphasis that we've been placing over the last several years about designations and going to the DMV, we're seeing that from 2009 to 2010, a lot more people knew about the DMV as the place that they can designate their wish. Um, so we know that that's working. What's kind of troubling a little bit is telling their family and thinking that's enough for them to make a decision. Um, we, you know, one of the messages that we always talk about is not only put it on your license, but tell your family what your decision mm -hmm. is. Now the donor card, that's going down, as it should. Um, and as an organization, we really don't promote donor cards. We don't talk about donor cards. We used to many years ago. But the reason why we have gone as far away from donor cards as possible is because we have no access to that information. So there's no database that we can access a donor card to see if someone made a decision. That's why we're really talking about the driver's license and the state ID cards, because that's information that we can access. And then we have the living will, and then the website. And I think one of the reasons why the website is increasing is because of the online capabilities that people can now go to. So why are some of the reasons why people <coughs> haven't registered yet? None of this should come as a surprise to you, probably. You know, people just haven't done it. They haven't considered it. You know, this is something that's not on everyone's radar, like it's on ours. Uh, with many health issues, if it doesn't concern you personally, you're going to kind of put it off. I think sometimes it depends on how old you are. You know, if you're young, yeah, this is the last thing from your mind. Um, also, a lot of times people didn't realize that you had to register to be a donor, that you had to go to the DMV, or that you had to go to a website to actually register. Um, and so what we're looking at is these are all things that can go down. And the way they can go down is by all of us promoting registries by talking about it when we go out and do education. Hmm. Uh, I can't see it. Uh -huh. <clears throat> the one I thought we were all getting more than anything else is that they don't want to register because they don't want, they're afraid that uh, somebody in the hospital is going to take their organs before they're dead. Mm -hmm. And that doesn't show up at all. Yeah. Well, these are the reasons why people haven't actually done it, <coughs> uh, haven't actually registered. I have, um, these are the reasons why people don't want to be a donor. And here's where you see mm -hmm. um, the medical care issue. You know, here's where you see, I don't think I'm going to be acceptable. You know, they want to keep their organs whole. They want to be buried whole. You know, what's interesting, it's a religious um, findings. That number has actually gone down. I think some of it is because of our National Donor Sabbath and really making an effort to go into churches and talking about it. Uh, I know many of the OPOs across the country have done that. Um, and, you know, the, these reasons down here, like uh, don't want the body cut up, immoral, no matter how much education we do, we're probably never going to be able to change their mind. And there are always going to be some people who just won't support their nation. But what I also wanted to do is once we had the top three reasons, not acceptable, haven't decided, or they want to keep their organs and be very whole, what we did then was to drill down and look at it according to age. Mm -hmm. And what this tells us, this can give us some messaging for when we go out to speak to groups. For example, the first one, not sure I'd be acceptable. Uh, you know, if you look at the, the youngest group, it's not really a concern because they're young, they're healthy, they've got their whole lives ahead of them. Uh, ahead of them. But when you look at people who are over the age of 65, it's 31%. Mm -hmm. Why do, you, why do you think that would be? You know, when you get older, you have health concerns. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, as 
I'm finding out. <laughs> uh, you know, you may be living with um, diabetes or hypertension. Um, you, you may think that I'm 65 years old, who, I can't be a donor, who would want my organs? And so when we go out to talk to people in that age group, we really need to stress, you know, there is no age limit, there's no rule out for being an organ donor besides HIV and active cancer, just to reassure them um, and to address that concern that they might have. You know, obviously a lot of people haven't decided. You know, once again, it's you know in the older uh, age groups that we have to work on. Um, and then also, what's interesting, want to keep the organs um, and to bury the whole funeral. And you'll see that that's the major concern about, among young people. I'm not quite sure why. I, you know, what I'm thinking is maybe you know we're a youth-oriented society. It's all about the looks, and maybe that's a concern that they might have uh, when they're young. I'm not sure. Yeah. This the, that's, I find that curious as well, and it's just odd to me because it would seem like the idea of keeping organs, when one keep organs, seem mm -hmm. to be more of a tied to just an older philosophy about the body, religion, mm -hmm. death, and stuff like that, which I wouldn't think the young, younger younger generation would, would carry that, which is why, I mean, that's why I find it odd, and I, I was curious why the reason, reason why, yeah. and obviously there's, there's not, nothing apparent, right? No, there's nothing apparent, <clears throat> because the other thing is we know that the group that has the highest uh, number of designations are young people, <coughs> high school and college students. Yeah, and we get that from our driver's license records. So, and then I thought I had, uh, okay. Um, so, in conclusion, uh, the implica implications of this is you know when I gave this presentation to the donors members, it was really to drive home the fact that we've seen significant increases in donor designations over the with our state registry teams. That we promote checking the registry each and every time, um, because one lost opportunity to have a donor means up to eight people not getting the gift of life um, with organ donation. And also to stress that we do now have the ability to measure uh, the effectiveness of programs uh, on donor designations. And also, with transplant centers especially, we're looking at a 75% conversion rate because we really want to try and maximize the total number of gifts that an, in an individual can give. Um, and then also, it's all about increasing the number of transplants. But for me, it's more about giving each person that opportunity to give that gift of life. And so that's why you know, we're out there, as you are, constantly talking about designation, educating them, so that more lives can be saved. These are just some of the national resources that we have, primarily through the Donate Life America site. This information is on their website, and you can access that at any time. You can Google um, Donate Life America, or you can go to their DLA members website. That's it. Thank you. Do you have any no questions? password required for any of that? Could, um, could you put that back up again? Yeah. There's a there's a public site part of that site and then there's also um, a private site for those of us who are working with state registry teams. Um, but most of this information you can you can just go right on. Uh, on the public site there's not a password then should be that you would need. Susan. Yeah, I have two questions. On this on the goal of seventy five percent conversion rate, that's um, the desire to have seventy five percent of, of deaths be re be registered. No, but that or, means or be that eligible. Seventy five percent of the individuals who could be donors actually go on to become donors. Where's the uh, good uh, Well, okay, because my other question was, and maybe I was going to ask you, what's the percentage of donor does it designates who are actually eligible to be donors? Like somebody could be signed up to be a, a, right. a, a, a donor, but they're sick at the time or right. for some other reason. Mm -hmm. They don't you know, die in the manner right. that, that enables right. them. Is there any statistics kept on that? Um, not, not on a national level. There isn't. 
Uh, we know currently with Gift of Life, out of the number of potential um, medically suitable potential donors, we had 38% of them had the donor designation. So, and see, that's why it's important for us to keep uh, educating people to get that more people to be designated um, so that if there is that opportunity for an individual to become a donor, that we have that designation. Because as you mentioned, out of all the deaths in the United States, one, one and a half percent could be a potential organ donor. So that's why the number is so small, because it depends on how a person, as you well know, how a person dies. This may only apply to Pennsylvania, but when you renew your driver's license or you renew your car registration, you can designate a donation, a dollar donation. Is there any relationship that has been followed of how many people donate the dollar compared to how many people are registered as donors within Pennsylvania? Because no. that's a way of educating people mm -hmm. by having that on the form. Right. So it's there. And right. There, we can't track. We can't track that because it's it's um, two different things. Because the dollar does the dollar contribution goes to the Department of Revenue, and the designations are all through the department. Well, I just I thought maybe there was just a way of tracking the percentage of people that would check that as a as a right. way of. Right. <laughs> yeah, um, there's not a way that we can, that we track it. But what I can say is that we're in Pennsylvania. We're pretty fortunate because out of that dollar check off, and currently individuals can only check off one dollar. They can't give more. They can't give less. They can only give a dollar. Um, that generates probably about seven to eight hundred thousand dollars a year, and that money gets pulled into a trust fund. And that's where we do a lot of our public education on a statewide level, as well as school programs and um, a program for a $300 benefit for to underwrite costs for individuals in the hospital, primarily with living donation. So they are aware of it if they check they the dollar, check off the dollar. Mm -hmm. Yes, they are aware of it. Um, and. Um, what, one of the things that we're also working on right now is with TAG and messenger services in the state of Pennsylvania, that's another opportunity for you to go and make that dollar check off. So we're educating those, um, those staff to, um, to ask people to, to suggest that they make that dollar contribution so we can increase those, the money available. And what is that, what is that doing? Is that doing that for what? It's called TAG and messenger services. An individual, an individual is in a hospital. The doctor has declared them brain dead. The doctor is going to call gift of life. Is the doctor going to call the doctor is going to call gift of life, whether or not they have a donor designation on them or not? Right. Do we know the percentage of those patients that do not have a donor designation, but their family has said yes at the time of um, brain death? We do. We we can find that number. Um, I don't know it off the top of my head. Is, do you, do, is it high? Is it low? Is it in the middle? We have no idea what the suit is. Is it the two thirds? One third have a, has a desert, the other two thirds aren't. Okay. Right. So two thirds of the people will say yes to organ donate, even though know they don't have designation on their license at the time of death. Yeah. Yes. Sir. This relates to what Sue was saying. There's a big difference between your driver's license and your vehicle registration. Mm -hmm. there, there's no correlation. I mean, as a representing a company, I, I register thir 13 vehicles that aren't mine every year, mm -hmm. and all 13 of those registrations are paying the extra dollar. No, I know, but I meant when people renew your driver's license. Yeah, but it's different when you renew your re registration. Right, it's but I was just wondering renewal. if there was any way that they were able to check, track who said yes when they renewed their driver's license to the dollar donation. And, and also to the dollar There's not, a, there's not, a, yeah, yeah. They're not yeah. connected. But did, did you ever try it and, it, and I don't even know who you would go to, maybe transportation people inside trucking companies, 
to, um, to educate them about the dollar donation, to get them, it's not, it's not donor designations, but it's, right. you know, it's dollar bills. Right. To try to educate. We haven't done as much companies. Um, you know, what we've done, what we've been doing is focusing primarily with um, DMVs and PennDOT initially. Now we're moving to tag and messenger services. Uh, many times they, you know, companies go there to help do their car registration, their vehicle registration. Um, you know, with limited resources, there's only so many. How about Keystone AAA? They've got a whole department that, that does right. nothing but registration. We have done um, presentations with AAA, and they're part of what we consider the tag and messenger services. Okay. So we are working with them. Joey, you got it. So obviously, your goal is to you know increase number of donations, people signing up, and seems like you guys are successful in re reaching that goal. Um, is it? Eventually, is it going to be a point where you expect it to plateau, where you may not be able to continue that increased growth? That is some of the, I, th I think there eventually would be, would be a plateau. Mm -hmm. And I think some of the states, for example, Utah, Washington, um, Indiana, they're kind of at the level where they can't really increase too much more because we're already at somewhere between 65, 75%. Um, that's probably where the plateau will, will be. Now, with our states, we've got a ways to go before we, before we actually mm -hmm. get there yet. But I do think eventually there's always going to be a percentage that will say no and will not support it regardless of how much you educate them. So eventually there will be a plateau. But, yeah. And I, I would think it's probably going to be more about that 65 to 75%. Uh, at this point, you know, is developing guidelines for measuring OPOs, like they do with transplant centers. Uh, are donor designations part of what they're proposing to measure the effectiveness of OPOs, or is it just recoveries and so forth? And secondly, do you have any opinions about that idea, the fact that there are going to be measuring OPOs like Gift of Life mm -hmm. as they do the transplant centers now? Well, I'm... Um I'm not sure what the measurements will be, but you know I think we should all be held accountable to standards across the industry. So whatever they would be, you know, I'd be fine with that. Um, personally, I don't not speak on <laughs> on behalf of the organization. Um, in terms of designations, um, when uh, AOPO comes uh, to do accreditations for us, you know, one of the things with community relations is we really have to show what our community education initiatives are. Uh, and one of the things is really talking about donor designations. I do know that there's been talk among people in the, in the OPO world looking at making sure and seeing how we can track if OPOs, tissue banks, buy banks are checking the registry each and every time to see if there's a designation. And that may eventually be one of the measures of, uh, for accreditation, which I'm all for it. Bring them on. Yeah. I mean, we do it, everyone else should too. Yeah. So. Any other questions? Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, John. Thank you, John. And on behalf of the uh, trio who sponsored the, the presentation, so we give you a little token of our Great. appreciation. And thank you again.